2 Peter chapter 3. We're coming to the end of 2 Peter um, tonight. Uh, this is a book that is written uh, because of difficulties, because of um, bad teaching, people who will be called away. We're going to look, our, our text is going to be verse uh, 315 through the end of the, uh, under the book. And it does have really a, a passage that I find so winsome, it just makes me smile, as it talks about uh, St. Paul and what he has uh, written and how some people twist what they say, what he says. So let's give our attention I think I'm going to start in verse 14, but we'll, we'll be looking at verses 15 through 18. Hear God's word. Therefore, beloved, since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them in these things, these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for your word, all of your scripture, given for our prophet given to rebuke and correct and encourage and build in righteousness, to instruct, we ask that you would instruct us. Move our hearts, our minds, and our wills that we would learn of this life and this glory that you have given to us in Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I said, Peter wrote this letter to correct and to warn people about the teaching of the false prophets. And the reason it's, it's difficult and important is because false teaching can be fatally false. There's a lot of uh, teaching that's not really fatally false. It's just, it's not quite right. It's not terribly helpful. But there is some teaching that we call heresy, and we shouldn't throw that word around willy-nilly that heresy will actually separate us from Jesus. And if you're not with Jesus, then you're not going to be saved. That's a very serious charge. And Peter's talked about it, and Paul talks about it, and John talks about it. We read about it throughout the New Testament. One of the heresies that Paul warned against in the book of Galatians is that of the Judaizers. And we might say they're the, the, the legalists. They're the ones that say, oh, Jesus is nice, that's fine, but you make sure you've got to do all the ceremonies, you've got to do all the festivals, you've got to keep all the, you have to be really good Jew because uh, Jesus kind of helps us good Jews to become better Jews or something like that. And they would insist on the fact that, you know, you, you, you must become everything that we are. And, and Paul says, look, we couldn't do that when we were trying to be good Jews and I was a better Jew than you. And he was. We, we want to give them the same gospel that we have. So this is, this is one of the things they were fighting against. Now, on the other side of that, there was uh, James and, and Peter, who also taught that, uh, in fact, James specifically, he says there's some people that say, well, if you say you're with Jesus and nothing changes in your life, that's fine. And there are people that say that now. Oh, you... It, and I've said this before, they say, well, I, you can't say that Jesus must, he could be your savior, but it doesn't have to be your Lord. And I say, well, the Lord Jesus is the savior. 
If you're connected to a Jesus who is not the Lord Jesus, you're connected to the wrong Jesus. And that, that really is a heresy. You must know that it's the Jesus that we, that we follow is the Lord Jesus. I mean, Peter was saying, if there's nothing changed in your heart and life, then it's not real. Did I say James? James. Well, Peter does too, but James. He says, uh, you can talk about your faith. I'll show you my faith in my actions. I, I believe this and I live that way. You'll know I believe this because I live this way. This is what I try to do. Now here, Peter is speaking. Actually, they even criticized Paul. They said, well, he's, Paul is teaching this, this uh, salvation that doesn't have a change in life. And in uh, Romans, he says, what should we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may, be, may abound? This is what they were saying Paul was saying. He says, no. Um, loosely translated, he says, are you nuts? That's uh, by no means. There's, there's a, it's a strong statement. We're saved by grace through faith, and that's a gift of God. It's not of ourselves. It's not of our works. No one can boast. In fact, we are God's workmanship, created due to the good works that God's prepared for us in advance to do. Well, that just ties the whole thing up, isn't it? We're not saved by our good works, but we are saved unto good works. And the new life in Christ is real. Now here, Peter is speaking about an important topic of our salvation. It's something that's important to us. And we can have lots of questions. I mean, there's lots of things like, well, why am I saved? Why are they not saved? What about those people? All these kind of questions. Realize this, whatever your questions are, there's something more important than that. And that is your relationship with God and your salvation. One of our hymns even says, you know, uh, why was I a guest? And it's not like questioning God. It's just like, this was, uh, when nice things happen to good people, you kind of get it, but I, I wasn't all that nice. And how does this all given to me? It's so much greater. It's done by your loving Savior. Verse 15, let's take a look at our text. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom God gave him. Now, we've been talking here about God's timetable. It's not our timetable. Uh, Psalm 90, you know, a thousand years are in his sight. is like a day. It's God is not in time. We've talked about this here, and Peter's talked about this as well. And what he's saying here is that judgment is coming, and the, the day of the Lord will come. You know, back in verse 11, all these things will, will happen the earth's going to be dissolved. What kind of people should we be? That's an important thing to think about. But you might be thinking, well, why is it taking so long? And there's people that are asking that. Why is God so patient? And here he's talking about the patience of the Lord as we talk about salvation. By the way, our brother Paul wrote to you all that he says. And later he does say, as people twist the other scriptures, he's saying that the writings of Paul are the New Testament, are the scriptures. Already, when this is being written, the letters of Paul are circulating and people are recognizing that this is Christ's word to his church through his apostle. Well, let's talk about some of the ways that Paul talks about the, the patience of God, the, the forbearance of God. Favorite verse of mine, as you know, in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, you know, why, why is God not swift to smite the wicked? And this is what he says. It's to give people time to repent. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness, that is, his withholding, his waiting on judgment, must lead you to repentance? Repentance. But then it goes on from there. Here's another one, Romans, well, you know Romans 3.23. Let me read 3.23 through 3.26. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Now why? It was to show his righteousness at the present time 
so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God was patient throughout the Old Testament. God was patient with people. Even in Christ's coming, there's a patience. And then in the fullness of time, he comes. This is God's plan. God's patience for the wicked actually works for us as well. I mean, if we're being harmed by the wicked, we're thinking, Lord, why don't you take care of them? But God's being patient for them. That's, that's actually a blessing to us too. In fact, it's so difficult, Paul almost says it in a whisper. I think it's J.I. Packer in one of his books. This is what he says. It's just, just listen to the way he says this. this is in Romans chapter 9, verse 22 to 23. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for his glory? And again, I like what Packer says there. It's it's, what if God is actually showing his, his grace to you in the, what he does with the wicked, in showing mercy to them, and then later showing judgment on them. Romans 11, verse 22. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who've fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Now, there's a lot in that passage, but... It just illustrates that God is God and God's patience is there for the good of his people and all the good of creation. And our task is not to justify the ways of God to men. Our task is to glorify God who is the creator. Theodicy is the word they use to justify the works of God to man, but God doesn't come to the bar and get cross-examined by us. He is the Almighty. Many times, people will try to twist the scriptures to do just that, though. And this is what Peter's talking about here. All right, backing up. Verse 15 and 16. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him. Just as he does in all his letters, and he speaks of these, them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. I really kind of like that. There's some things about St. Paul that's a little hard to understand. Peter says this. Have you ever read this and go, what's he being here? What's he saying here? People debate about this. Some things to consider, though. Peter's already described about the scriptures. In fact, you can look back, chapter 1, not far, up too far, because it's verse 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. In other words, it's not, I made this up, this is my best guess. No, that's not where the scripture comes from. Verse 21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is what Peter understands Scripture to be. This is what Peter understands his own writing to be. And he's also understanding this as what St. Paul's writing is. It's not something you make up out of your own head. It's not pious advice. What, pious advice is, well, this is, this is pious advice. It's not a rule. I'm just, this is my best thought. If you want to know, have you ever heard that expression? Sure you have. Pious advice. It's like, that's no, no, this is, this is God's word. The Holy Spirit superintends the writing of the scripture so that the human words from the human person is going to be what God wants to be communicated. God is communicating himself in our language, because we can't understand any other. God's speaking to us. And then the New Testament, here we see, is being received as the word of God 
even before all of it's written. And by the way, you can, you can see how the New Testament was gathered. The people began to recognize this is the same spirit here written that I know in Christ. It's the same spirit that saved me. And everywhere, always, and by all, it, it just went along. And that's how we saw this is scripture. The letters of Paul were received as written to the whole church. Now, we've been looking at Ephesians, but Ephesians, as I've said at the beginning, the word, the saints in Ephesus, that word in Ephesus is not all in all of the earliest copies we have. It could be that that was designed to be a circular letter and wound up in Ephesus because Ephesus was the big city. The big, it was the capital of the, of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, in Turkey. That, that's, so, but it, it wasn't written just to those people in Ephesus. It was written to all the Christians, and it's written by us as well. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, so this is a, a recognition that these letters of Paul, this will get confusing, but I'm going to say it anyway. They were Catholic epistles. We have, uh, well, we have the epistles of Paul, the letters of Paul, and then we have the general epistles, which are like everybody else. But Paul's letters, even the ones written to individuals like Titus or Philemon, they are general letters. They are to the whole church. You see what I mean? It's for you. It's for me. This is the word of God. We are part of the general church of Jesus. These letters are to us. And they would also look at what was written, look at what was said, and that would be the canon or the yardstick by which they'd measure other people. How do you measure a preacher who's preaching the word of God? By the, by the word of God. Is it in the word of God? Does it square with the word of God? And that's why I expound the scripture. I try to stay close to the scripture because the closer I am to the scripture, <laughs> the more keyed in I am on it, right? Stay there. Camp there. This letter is seen as, as scripture early on. Now, there's a, there's a, a letter. I use this to my, with my Greek students when I can. It was written by a man named Polycarp who was a martyr, and he was the bishop of Smyrna, which was not that far from Ephesus. It's one of the cities that uh, Jesus writes to through John in the book of Revelation. There's the seven cities. Smyrna's one of them. They even have churches named Smyrna. He was born around 69 AD, AD 69, and uh, he knew, I mean, he may have known the apostle John because of where he was and when he was. So he's that's another interesting connection. Uh, he wrote a letter to the church at Philippi, which is across the water in northern Greece, and because they asked him to. And he says, now look, I'm writing you this letter because you asked me to. Uh, but I'm not writing like the blessed St. Paul. I mean, we do not, we, I do not have attained to his wisdom. And that's the very thing that Peter's talking about here, the wisdom given him. In other words, he's saying, Paul wrote the Bible. This is what Polycarp is saying around the year, I don't know, 135, somewhere around there. His, his life and his martyrdom is a fascinating story. He, 80, 87 years old or more, and they, they hauled him in to talk about his faith. And they started because he was an old man to give him a, a ride to the Colosseum to you know, have this out. And when it became clear, he says, well, I've served Jesus 87 years. He's never done me any harm. I'm not going to start to deny him now. They kicked him out and kind of pushed him along. <clears throat> anyway, uh, he was away. And if you read his letter, it sounds a lot like St. Paul. You know why? Because he read St. Paul. In fact, he's writing to the Philippians, and he says, now, you know that letter that Paul wrote you all back a while ago? You know, you ought to read that now. <laughs> anyway. Again, the rest of verse 16 has always made me smile. Uh, this is what uh, Peter says about Paul's writing. Some things in them are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people uh, have are a twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. 
there, the people misunderstood Paul because he can be a little hard to understand. Is that still true? It is, and people still twist it. People twist the words of Paul because it doesn't fit in with what's in their minds. And so, well, this is the way I view the world, and that's not right. I've got to twist it to fit my mind. Well, that's not the purpose of the Bible, to twist the Bible to fit your mind. It's to unlock your mind to understand the ways of God. Is it possible to twist the scriptures, even if you know them well? Well, the devil did, didn't he? He took Psalm 91, and he was going to twist that into something else, and Jesus kind of said, uh-uh. The scripture really is this. The scriptures can be hard to understand. Uh, take again the book of Revelation. There's been some controversy about that book. Basic thing of the book, though, is Jesus is victorious. And you've heard the story. I've told it several times. You know, Jesus wins. That's the thing. Don't lose that. And there are people that say, well, I want to understand this and set up my distinctions of, no, we, we believe this and you're not right on this. And we, this is our scripture we're basing this on. And it's, there's a lot of twisting there. Um, Peter calls these people who are ignorant and unstable. Now, I'm not criticizing anyone particularly, but ignorant and unstable is when you're twisting the scriptures. If you don't quite figure it out, what you do is you know what you know and you understand what you don't know as well by what you do know and you treat it with humility. What is the scripture about in Revelation? Well, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ who is shown gloriously in the beginning. He is the lamb on the throne who was slain and yet is alive. He is the one who comes at the end with the armies of God to slaying the enemies with the word of his mouth and on his garments is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And they say, hallelujah. The Lord God, omnipotent reigns. Take the book of Romans. Now there's a book with a lot of theology. Countless misinterpretations of Paul's words can be a little hard to grasp, partly because he'll start to talk about something and then put something else inside it and then come back to this. And it takes you, have to, you have to diagram it out sometimes. That's okay. He's dense. He puts it all in there. Um, Peter calls people who twist these things, though, as ignorant and unstable. Ignorant means they've not been taught. And maybe they've read it and they haven't really figured it out. And they start to talk. You look through the church history. There's all kind of people with strange ideas. And some of them have just strange ideas. And then others say, wait, this sounds like this heresy. Is that what you're telling I said, well, I guess so, and then they'd find themselves in great trouble. Better to say, I don't know. You know. Better to say, teach me. I want to be taught. Now, all of our ministers in, in uh, our denomination, they're supposed to be trained. We go to seminary, and we're supposed to, I was listening to a fellow, you're supposed to, all, we're all supposed to know Hebrew and Greek, at least a little bit, enough to get us through the exam. And, but the purpose, of course, is to read the scriptures and be able to see what's there and not be fooled. We are trained, and then we're examined. And you go to these examinations where they're examining these candidates, and they ask them all these questions, and some of them they're going to, I don't know, don't get them wrong. And I had one fellow say, look, if you think you can get everything right, I'll stump you just to show you that you need more to learn, because we do. We continue to learn. However, you do demonstrate that you are at least trained, that you understand. You understand what the scripture says. You understand what the church teaches. And you agree with it. Um, I continue to study what other people say about the scriptures. I've got commentaries. Some of those people are dead, some long dead, some still alive. But I can see and I can be blessed as I continue to study and understand. And I'm accountable too. I'm accountable to the elders in this church. I'm accountable to the presbytery. More importantly, I'm accountable to God. When one is not ignorant, when one is trained, they're less likely to be fooled easily. So be aware of those who are fooled easily. Don't be one. How do you get trained in the scriptures? You read them. Yes, it, it's not that hard. The other description he gives, though, is that they're unstable. 
Now, I've seen people graduate from seminary able to answer all the questions put at them, and yet there was something wrong with these guys. And we let one through, and this happened in that church plant. It just went kaput. And I said, you know what? I saw this early on. And one of the things that we used to say was, one, uh, to become a, a under care, you have to have a letter of endorsement from your church because the church knows who you are. You can fool some people in a room for a few hours, but they know your character. You present yourself for ministry, you come under care. If you don't have the character for ministry, you shouldn't be doing ministry. That's the unstableness. You need to have the character for ministry. There are some people that constantly fight. That's what they do. That wears me out. They shouldn't be in ministry. I uh, heard mention John Maxwell uh, earlier today. He had a thing. He said, hey, hurt people hurt people. Hurting people will hurt other people. When people are hurting, take care of them. Don't be stupid. Don't put them in a position of leadership where they can hurt other people, right? That's unstable. Those who are in leadership must be studied in the things of the Lord and be stable. They need to be growing in faith and growing to be more like Jesus. On my previous church, I had a quote from R.L. Dabney, who was a theologian from the 1800s. It was, eloquence may dazzle and please, holiness of life convinces. You can say and talk a good game, but you have to faithfully live the life. That's the reality of the Christian life. And I'll say this before, people will say, well, I'm not perfect. Don't judge Jesus based on me. Who else are they going to base him on? They see you. And it's not that you're perfect. They want to know that this is real. And if it's real in your life, they can maybe have a hope that it's real in theirs. So this is what he's warning against. Be forearmed, forewarned, forearmed. And here's the warning, verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Don't let those people draw you into their orbit and knock you off your foundation so that you begin to slip. Now, the most famous sermon, I would argue, preached on these shores in the last 300 years was Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Does anybody know the text that he preached from? It's Deuteronomy 32, 25. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Recompense for the time when their foot shall slip. Or in the King James, their foot shall slide in due time. That sliding that he talks about is a sliding off even into eternal judgment, into hell. And he describes it, you as a horrid-looking spider from a string, a small strand, and it's only the mercy of God that it doesn't break and you fall into there before the morning, maybe before I'm finished preaching. This is the, of course, he, he, he did it in a rather straightforward tone, but the image was there. This is, this is what Peter's warning against as well. Don't slip. Don't lose your stability. Those who twist the scriptures, don't be taken in by them. Don't attach yourself to them and slide with them. Who should you be attached to? Jesus. Particularly, Peter's warning against those who say it's okay to live as the, war, as the world lives. This is what he said in this letter. And it's not. As Paul says in Galatians, that letter where he's warning against the legalists, Galatians 5, verse 1, for freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It's for freedom that you've been made free in Christ, free from sin. Don't go back to that. That's slavery. You're free now to live in Christ. Well, Peter ends this brief letter with not the negative, but something very positive. Verse 18, but grow in the grace of and the knowledge of our Lord 
Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever to the day of eternity. Amen. That day of eternity, that's the judgment day he's talking about. So what's the opposite of being taken in by the ignorant and unstable and having your feet slip? The opposite of that is growing in Christ. Again, that's why I love our tagline, grow in Christ with us. Put it on the sign, put it on the bulletin. That's what we're about here. We know Jesus, love Jesus, and grow in Jesus. Everything that's alive grows. Right? It grows. This is what we do. We grow in our knowledge through the scriptures. We grow in our experience by the grace of God and our character. That's what we're called to do. And to him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for your word, your word which clearly talks about your word, your word which has guided your saints through the history of the church and continues to guide her. Thank you for bringing us into your family. Give us hearts that are charitable, hearts that are not going to be wasting time with foolishness, voices that will plead with others to call on Christ. Lord, we ask that you would keep us from being those who are so ensnared by our own knowledge that we're unwilling to listen to the gentle voice of your spirit, that you would free us from falling under the influence of those so committed to their own voice that they don't hear the words of your word and your spirit. Lord, we thank you for your grace. I pray, Lord, that your salvation indeed would be seen in people. So many who no one would believe they would ever turn to Christ. And yet you reach in and you change them. Lord, give us faith that we can be used to reach others. And give us faithfulness that we will continue to encourage one another. All this we ask for the glory of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray and in whose life we